Good afternoon. My name is Don Vivret, and I'm your host for today, as I have been for the other ones. So let me advance this a slide or two. Got to move something out of the way. There you go. Good. Okay. Uh, welcome to It's Your Money. Uh, obviously, we're doing this virtually this time. The subject today is medical care planning. And we have a very good presentation on that one coming up in just a minute. I want to go through a couple of things with you first, as I have each week. Um, one is the registration for the process. You've all registered, as we said before, there's like 300 of you total, about 200 for each of them. Uh, there's a question that comes up every single week in question and answers on where do I find the handout material? And honest to goodness, Lee, um, on the website is the material. And it's at materials.itsyourmoneyandestate.org. And this little piece here that I seem to be having a problem highlighting is uh, directly out of the reminder that you got today and that you also got yesterday. At the bottom of the reminder, it has this, and you can click on the link and it will take you to that page. So for the question we get every week, there's your answer in terms of where you go. You cannot turn on your audio or your video uh, for a webinar. You'll use the question and answer. So there's a Q and A button on your screen. If you can't see it, move your mouse or tap your screen or something, and it will probably come up. If you click on that, you can send messages. I will get them. Um, I review them, and I ask the questions as we go along, as we have before. The sessions are recording, and I made certain this time that I did start the recording on time. Um, so it will be recorded probably tomorrow or the next day. It will be up on the website. How long do these things stay there? Um, I'm going to tell you they're probably going to be there until the spring. Uh, there's some older pieces in there anyway, so they'll be there for a good period of time. So you don't need to worry too much about having them go away too quickly on you. Here's where you go. It's your money, it's your estate. Click on which of the two programs you want, scroll down to the week, and that will give you the PDF or, as you can see on item number one here from week one, that's the video for the sessions that we have right now. Question also come up about the charities. Charities for your information are also on there under sponsors. We'll show you the various, various charities and you have the ability to click on those and go to their websites. There are occasionally also, as there is today, um, additional handout material for the supporting sponsor, which is Chalk. Um, they had also given us some material, so I believe that's also there on the handouts. The subject today is um, managing care, me medical care planning, obviously a mental issue also. Um, and so that's the subject where we're going to go through today. Next week, we'll start into equity investing, then fixed, and then wrap up on week eight. Normally, we physically go to these locations. I want to thank them for service in the past. And I truly hope that in the spring, we're all able to be together physically, because that's a lot better than doing these virtually. Uh, but just want to make sure that we shout out and thank them. These are the participating charities, as I do each week. Chapman University, 10-year sponsor, and... I'm going to be selfish and I'm going to give an, a plug for ourselves. Tomorrow on the uh, It's Your Estate side, David Moore from Chapman and I will be doing charitable giving. Now, don't panic and think that that's horrible and we're going to tell you you have to give away money. It's more a matter of things to consider if you wish to give money to someone because you can, we'll get into depth on it, but it really is a very important subject to talk about. And so that's tomorrow that David and I are doing that one on the estate side. Today's charity, ironically, we're doing medical planning, happens to be chalk. Um, so I'm going to attempt to uh, connect to the video on that and that and that and share video. Since 1964, Chalk Children's has been dedicated to nurturing, advancing, and protecting the health and well-being of children. That dedication is at the core of everything we do. Today, our healthcare system includes two pediatric hospitals, more than 100 programs and services, numerous primary and specialty care health centers, a research institute, several centers of excellence focused on providing the best treatment for the most serious illnesses and injuries, and a team of extraordinary healthcare professionals whose compassion, determination, and intellect drive them to push the boundaries of what is possible to advance pediatric medicine and cures. From our pediatricians in the community to our specialists in our intensive care units, everyone across our enterprise is committed to having Chalk Children's be the leading destination 
for children's health by providing exceptional and innovative care whenever and wherever it is needed. We know families have a choice in choosing their health care providers and are honored when parents and patients place their trust in us, an enormous responsibility we don't take lightly. We consider it a privilege to play a role in bringing hope, health, and happiness to children and their families, helping to secure the brightest of futures. Hi, everyone. My name is Denise Ogawa, and I'm so happy to be here with you today from Chalk Children's Foundation. We have sponsored this series for many years, and so I've been to most of these sessions several times over, and I always seem to learn something new. There's such good information, so I'm really glad that you all are here. If we were lucky enough to be together, really together in person at this moment, I would happily invite you for a tour of the Chalk Children's Campus in Orange, and which would give you the opportunity to take a deeper look into some of the programs and services that you just learned about in the video. Looking toward the future, there will be a time for this again, someday. And so please consider this to be your open invitation to contact me anytime. And I would be happy to have you in for a behind the scenes tour where I promise you'll be inspired by so many of the incredible things that happen at Chalk on a daily basis from the doctors and nurses to the child life team, the volunteers, and even our pet therapy dogs who do an amazing job cheering up the children who are in the hospital. Some of you may be aware of Chalk's mental health initiative, but just in case you're not in the spirit of learning, because this is class today, I would like to share with you just a little bit of information on that subject. Here are just a few statistics for your knowledge. Did you know that one out of every five young people in the United States today has a diagnosable mental health disorder before they turn age 18? And in Orange County alone, that means 150,000 children. In addition, half of the adults who struggle with mental illness had symptoms before the age of 14, but most of them received no help. To that end, in 2018, Chalk opened a mental health inpatient center to serve children three to 17. It is the first center of its kind in Southern California to accept children under the age of 12. And to no one's surprise, since the centers opened, it has been at or near capacity. Together with community partners, Chalk is working to break the stigma surrounding pediatric mental health and to increase access to much needed care. At Chalk, we believe that mental health is as important as physical health and that investing in the mental health of our children today is needed to create a healthier community for all of us in the future. So when you come in for that tour, we can talk more about this subject and more. But in the meantime, if I can be helpful to you in any way, in the way of information about chalk or information about philanthropic planning, please feel free to contact me anytime. I promise I'm always happy to help and there's never any pressure for anything more than that. So get back to class and enjoy these great workshops. Thanks a lot for your time. Okay, so there you go. Hello, Pete. I was going to say, Pete, come on up. So what's going to happen at this point? Incidentally, I have to do something here because I was attempting to do this before, but I couldn't. I voted. <laughs> I don't honestly care. I do care a lot, but I'm going to tell you, I don't care who you vote for, but vote so that your, your input is given. There you go. There's my plug. I'll keep doing that. Okay, Pete, um, you're up and I'm going to review the review the in the background, the question and answers, and send it to you and I will see you later. Okay, thank you, Don. Um, shout out to Denise, uh, that was just awesome. Uh, Children's Hospital is just amazing. They just take every child from, uh, you know, I, I, my, my niece works as a registered nurse and the Nick, Nico Ward and they have babies like they're, two inches big and it, they're just a fantastic institution and the fact that they're start now starting to get into a mental illness is just so awesome you know you always hear there is um, money is the root of all evil well i'll tell you if you want to do something good with your money uh 
Shock is just a wonderful institution. They help out so many kids and people and uh, they're wonderful. Uh, Leanne, why don't you uh, come on board? Um, hello, and hello. go ahead and uh, put up your uh, outline. And in the meantime, I just wanna make sure that uh, everybody understands I'm gonna be more than moderating today. Uh, I'm gonna be a co-presenter with Leanne. Um, I've been a healthcare agent for approximately 25 years. Uh, just this week, I met with uh, two individuals to talk about death. Uh, I met with a primary care physician to make sure that he understood uh, that, uh, that the individual that I was helping out did not want to linger. Um, this morning, I was reading the uh, New York Times, and there was a quote in there um, from um, a philosopher, and he was saying, confronting death is one of the most important and difficult tasks we face as humans. And I think that's so true. And medical planning, uh, at least in our own personal family, took the biggest chunk of money out of our net worth than anything else uh, uh, around. And, and if you look at the statistics, the last six months of life is when most people spend the most on medical care. And so uh, from caregivers um, uh, to uh, prescription drugs, to medical equipment, uh, to insurance, uh, medical and death is just huge business. And so we're going to get, uh, we, we're really lucky today because Leanne is, uh, is going to be co-presenting with me. And I have hired, why don't we go to the next slide and show your ask first form. I have uh, hired Leanne on a number of occasions uh, with my clients uh, to help uh, uh, with the medical care planning. And we'll go through this in just a little bit, but uh, to introduce Leanne, Leanne, what is your bachelor's degree in? Bachelor, I actually have two bachelors, but my main one that I work with is Bachelor of Science in Nursing. Okay. And, and hello you, everybody. Yeah, <laughs> and you have 25 years of nursing experience in care management, but most individuals don't know your profession. So could, could you spend two or three minutes on describing what you do for people? So I do have this, Pete, on slides. Do you want me to fast forward a little bit to the slides on this? I, sure. No? Yes. Okay. Yes. So um, I'll just quickly, and you don't have to read all this, but just to know that this information is there once we finish here today, but being a care manager is sort of a generic term out there these days. It's a confusing term. Um, everybody has their own model of the way that they do care management. I have my own business. I've had my own business as a care management company for about seven years now, I guess going on eight. And um, we're a group of nurses. So our focus is very much on health care, on medical care of our clients. But you'll also have care managers who are social workers or gerontologists who may have a different focus. They may deal more with people that have uh, mental health issues or they have social issues. Um, so ours is a very clinical kind of basis. Care manager is also known these days as an aging life care professional. And we do have an association. This is an association that's actually been around for a long time. Um, and I'm gonna show you a slide on that in just a moment here. So you can contact um, that aging life care association if you need to in the future. But to answer the question that Pete has asked me, Care managers do a lot of different things. So when you talk to a care manager, you wanna find out from that person, what is their expertise? What kind of work do they do? Um, many times you'll hear answers like, I deal holistically with my clients. I do everything from taking them to doctor's appointments to making sure that their medications are set up proper, properly. I make sure that they have all the providers that they need. They get the neurologist or they have a referral for home health or maybe it's a referral to hospice. They oftentimes will function as a mediator. They will function as a liaison between all the different providers of care and all the different loved ones that are involved in someone's life. 
Um, there's many different roles that we play, but what we try and do is coordinate services, making sure that people get the right services at the right time. We want to make sure that we tap into benefits. Sometimes people don't realize they have a lot of benefits through Medicare. They might have some benefits like durable medical equipment in the home that would make them more mobile. They might have benefits in terms of home health, where they'll have a physical therapist come to the house or a speech therapist come to the house to evaluate how safely they're swallowing. There's a lot of resources out there that many times people don't even realize they have access to. Um, many times we're talking about advocating. I've done a lot of advocating for clients over the years, whether um, a family thinks that they're being thrown out of the hospital, quote unquote, too early, or um, maybe they're being sent home from the skilled nursing facility with nothing in place at home. So we do a lot of advocacy. Um, and we link them to the resources that I mentioned just a few minutes ago. So this is the organization here, Aging Life Care, and their website is up there for you to, um, to visit and to check out. But one of the most important things I think on this particular slide is to find an aging life care professional or care manager in your area. You can search for one. And this is one that maybe will help your mom, maybe it'll help you, maybe it'll help um, a friend of yours. Um, but uh, someone like a care manager will help to navigate that healthcare system um, for you. So that is the website that I would point you to. Um, so I've been doing this, as I say, for about eight years, but as a nurse in different settings for more than that, maybe 27, 28 now. <laughs> 28, it is 28. I just did some <laughs> magical math. It's 28 years. You're wiser. You're wiser I am. today. I'm not any older, but I'm wiser. <laughs> okay, let's go back to your uh, ask first form. Yep. And so you're a registered nurse, you're licensed, uh, you don't practice law, you put your client's interest first. How are you paid? We are paid privately out of pocket, I guess you could say. We don't have any coverage, no insurance covers care management at this point, nothing through Medicare. So it's pretty much 100% private pay. And uh, what do you charge? Um, our charge is 180 an hour. Uh, you'll have other care managers who might be a little bit more than that. Sometimes um, they're a little bit less, especially if they're working on their own. So you might have someone that's 150 or so that's a sole practitioner. Um, we happen to be a team model where we have several nurses working here, but um, a really good question to ask any care manager that you're interviewing. Yeah, um, uh, I've worked with Leanne and, and I was so lucky to find someone like Leanne because the, the terminology sometimes just in a particular disease or the coordination uh, between uh, the acute center and the heart specialist and with the uh, 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 d different medical personnel, it gets totally confusing. Mm -hmm. And you need somebody to assist whoever is your advocate, legal advocate. So when I serve in a per person's estate and I'm their healthcare agent, I have the legal right to make medical decisions that is in their best interest only if they are not competent or cannot communicate with the medical professional. I'm not a doctor, I'm not a nurse, and therefore having somebody like Leanne uh, available uh, is, is just a godsend. And, and it's, it may seem expensive on the front end, but it really isn't because she's not there for 24 seven care. She's there to help your agent for your health care make better decisions. And there's other people like Leanne in the community. Mm -hmm. uh, you're not associated with anyone who uh, sells annuities insurance uh, and the $20 I gave you as a kickback doesn't really count, I hope. <laughs> it was a Canadian 20, so it really doesn't There, there you go. Okay, and she certifies that the above is true and correct. So let's get into the medical care planning. Let's get into the outline. Okay. Let me fast forward here. A couple of slides here, right? Okay. Yeah. Now you uh, you want me to run through this, Peter, or you want to get going first? Well, first of all, uh, uh, what does acute care mean in a hospital and why do we need to know that? 
So acute care, obviously, if something's going off the rails, maybe someone is having a heart attack, maybe someone has been, um, you know, is having a stroke, you want to make sure that you're getting people into an acute care setting. And for most of us, when we think about that, we think of the hospital. And for uh, most of that, you're going through an emergency room, an emergency department to get some help quickly for whatever it is that's going on. And of course, there is um, coverage for this under insurance. There's um, available insurance for all these different levels of care, but the acute care is really a first step for a lot of people, especially for our elderly folks who may have a fall or maybe there's an acute exacerbation of something like a COPD or congestive heart failure that's going on. We wanna get that person immediately to see a medical, medical um, professional to get yeah. that addressed. And you won't be admitted unless you need acute care at the hospital. Right. So That's you could be point. in a semi state and not be admitted formally uh, for the hospital. Um, and Medicare um, pays for your stay in a hospital, correct? Right. Yes. And so that Medicare is part, part A does. That's part mm -hmm. A. And mm -hmm. so um, when does skilled care come into play? Well, let's say that our person that was having a stroke has been into the ER. They were admitted to the floor for maybe three or four days. Um, I'm sure all of you have experienced that the stays these days are much shorter than they used to be. People are sent from the hospital pretty darn quickly these days. Sometimes we don't even get admitted. To your point, Pete, a lot of times people don't even get admitted to the hospital. They get turned around and either sent home or um, you know, some other process happens, but they don't always get admitted to the hospital. So the skilled care comes in when they say, you know what, we're done here with acute care, nothing more that we need to do here. We're gonna get you over to a skilled nursing facility or rehab facility for some therapy to get you back on your feet again after you've, in this example, after you've had your stroke, we want you to go to acute rehab and we want you to get some physical therapy, occupational therapy, et cetera. So skilled care is really the place where you have 24 hour coverage, um, 24 hour nursing always available to you. You have your bed. Um, if you wanna have a private bed, you're gonna pay a little bit extra, but those are the places that are gonna provide you with the therapies, the dietitians, the nursing, the doctors, everybody that's needed to kind of get you back to a level of functioning where you can go back home. And home may be your private home, home may be a board and care, assisted living, but the eventual goal is to get you back to um, a, a center of a, um, a community based setting again. Yeah. So if you're if you're in the hospital and you just have Medicare coverage, you don't have any uh, Medigap or uh, any other type of HMO coverage, you are entitled to your hospital stay. And then if you go to a skilled nursing facility, so long as you were in the hospital three days plus one, then you get 20 days fully covered uh, skilled care. Mm -hmm. And then after 20 days, then it goes to 50% per day. So please understand the financials. Uh, when you go into an acute care facility, is your primary care physician your, uh, your doctor when you were in the hospital? So you will have a hospital list, which is basically a doctor who works at the hospital. This is likely not someone who knows you unless you're what's called a frequent flyer and they may recognize you as coming through the ER. Um, but let's go back to our example of the person with the stroke. That person will likely meet a hospital list when they first come into the hospital and that person will follow them through their hospitalization. Again, this is not a physician that will know that patient. Your primary care physician may receive a phone call or some notification to say, hey, your patient, um, Mr. Um, Mr. Cote is in the hospital at this time, but really there's no communication with the primary care physician. So this brings up a really good point that you didn't ask me about Pete, but I'm gonna go there anyways. These points of transition between going from home to hospital, hospital to skilled nursing, skilled nursing back to home, or maybe to a placement at a board and care, these are called times of transition, points of transition. This is a time that is shaky for the best of times. And even for us as healthcare 
professionals, it gets a little shaky. Um, a hospitalist that discharges a patient to a skilled nursing facility may make changes to that person's medications. They may make changes to their plan of care. So these are times where things tend to fall through the cracks. And I can't tell you how many times we've gone and met with a client who has come out of the hospital to a skilled nursing facility that the meds are not correct. They're missing things. They, um, you know, things just fall through the cracks, especially when someone is discharged home. So my cautionary tale on that one is just to make sure if you are going from setting to setting or your loved one is, this is a time to really pay attention to the orders, to the discharge orders that they're being um, sent home with, et cetera. It's a really key time where things can fall off the rails. Yeah, great, great point, Leanne. And in the skilled care, is your primary care physician involved in the skilled care? All right. Once again, this is not your primary care physician. It's going to be someone called the sniffist. SNF, um, SNF is skilled nursing facility. So these are doctors that specialize in working with uh, patients who are in a skilled nursing facility. And they're very specialized in that sort of zone. But again, it is not your physician. It is not someone who knows you and knows your plan of care or history. Yeah. And this is where we're also going with that you need your agent for your health care with you. And you need that legal document because it is a time of confusion. Mm -hmm. And so you need that HIPAA release so that the, your agent can talk to the medical professionals and understand what is going on. Yeah. Uh, today, the skilled nursing facilities are absolutely swamped. The acute care facilities are, you can sometimes go bowling in them. You know, mm -hmm. they're so, uh, people do not stay in the hospital very long. Yeah. Um, and they're, by the way, if you feel that you're being dismissed or discharged from the hospital too early, there is a number that you can call to have an outside agency that's a not-for-profit that will review everything and will give you a, a separate opinion whether or not the discharge is too early. And that's both from the hospital or the skilled care. And that's gonna be in your discharge paperwork. And you're gonna get discharge planning on the first day that you entered the hospital. Yeah. Okay, so uh, be aware of that. Yeah. What is custodial care? Well, custodial care is basically all the things that have to do with activities of daily living. So the things that we take for granted every day for most of us, getting up and getting dressed, getting bathed, well, maybe bathing and then dressing, um, getting our meals, getting our medications, all those things that we do every day are called activities of daily living. A custodial care setting refers to a where you can go and have those kinds of activities supported. Perhaps in this case, we've given a couple of examples here with a nursing home. And sure, you can have a custodial bed in a nursing home. Um, and they're going to help you with things like the bathing and the dressing and making sure you get your medications. You can also have that through a board and care setting, um, a small home, usually six beds. Um, also, you can have home care, which is a caregiving model where you can hire caregivers. This is not normally something that is covered, but if you have a long-term care insurance plan that's pretty good, you may get some coverage out of that for your caregivers. But these caregivers will come in and they'll help, they'll, they'll help with making some meals. They'll make sure that that individual is bathed, that person is kept safe during the time that they're there. Um, and if you have that 24-7, uh, it's expensive, but that's the way some people are able to do it if they have the funds to do so, which is ideal for a lot yeah. of people. And the activities of daily living is not covered by Medi-Cal or Medicare. Right. So, and most individuals, uh, um, uh, are reluctant to get this kind of help. And uh, we'll go into a little bit more of that, but let's go to the next wait, slide, wait, Leanne. Wait, Pete, wait, back yes. up, Leanne, back up. So do I understand this correctly? If I, if I go into the hospital and you, an example you had was, I go into the emergency room and they say, you know, we don't really think we're going to admit you. Let's send you over here to a skilled care facility. Oops. Now I have to pay for that. 
or I go into the hospital and I'm there for 48 hours, they send me to a, to a skilled nursing facility. Do I have to pay for that? Or is any part of this paid? Is it 100%? Is it all or nothing? I have to be there for three days plus a night or whatever it was? Mm -hmm. it, yeah, Leanne, you, do you want me yeah. to handle that or do you, do you want to handle it? E either way. No, you go ahead and I'll tack on anything. Okay. That you forget. <laughs> uh, it, if you want Medicare coverage and you don't have any other insurance, uh, then, and you don't, uh, then Medicare will cover your hospital visit. But if you need to go into a skilled care facility, that's where you're going to run into problems if you just have Medicare. They will not cover you, as I understand, or Medicare. Mm -hmm. You will have not to have those you. three, yeah, the three night overnight stays, yeah. Yeah, you have so to have other, them. So, in other words, if I'm there for Two and a half days, I said I should object to being discharged. You bet. Absolutely. <laughs> because that's you know? the way I'll be, I would be able to get it paid if I went then to skilled nursing. Yes. And then what we recommend highly is, is, is that who needs to know this? Your agent for your health care, because you're probably going to be either you're in the hospital and you've got to be there for a reason. So you're not going to be at the top of your game. Mm -hmm. So this is something that your agent for your health care needs to know. It's three days plus one if you don't have any insurance. If you have an HMO or a Kaiser or some other type of insurance, when we'll talk a little bit more about that, you have to understand the contract. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, let's go to the next slide. So we talked a little bit about part A, hospital skilled nursing, hospice and some health laboratories. That's what part A covers, correct? Yep. And then uh, part B, medical, uh, home health, durable medical equipment, advanced care planning. What does that mean? Ooh, I'm so glad you asked, Pete. So Medicare uh, Part B, and this came out a few years ago, and I kind of threw this in and threw you off there, Pete, but I did add that today because there was a time where the doctors wouldn't really have those advanced care planning discussions with their patients in their offices because they weren't getting reimbursed for that time. Um, and that's kind of a sad thing. But now Medicare will now pay for your doctor to sit down with you and go over your choices about end of life care. So that's a really important piece of our planning. So whether you're 18 or, or 118, that is a conversation that everybody should be having with their primary care physician, right? So um, especially for people who are coming into a zone of life where they're having more and more complications, they're hitting the ER every few months, they're having crises after another, one after another, they really need to sit down and talk to the doctor about what does this mean for me? If I was to be resuscitated, what does this mean for me? What does a feeding tube mean for me? So what this payment part of part B allows is for doctors to say, you know what, I'm gonna spend the next 10, 15 minutes talking to you about your advanced care planning. That is a really important piece that people need to take advantage of. Um, yeah. Call up and, and say, I need an extra 15 minutes on my appointment on my wellness exam because I wanna go over my, my five wishes or I wanna go over my advanced healthcare directive um, with him or her. So, and how medical doctors get reimbursed is they use a wellness plan. Okay, Medicare pays X amount for a wellness plan. They pay X amount for an advanced care planning. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's, uh, and the average primary care physician has 3000 plus patients. So, uh, you know, uh, you've got to, you can't be a wallflower. You've got to ask uh, for these services. Mm -hmm. uh, part C is Medicare Advantage. What is that? So those are those managed kind of plans. So you might have a Blue Cross, you might have a, a United, you might have a scan. Scan, yeah. yeah. Um, so a Medicare Advantage program. And really it's it's um, sponsored through Medicare, but it's provided by those, those private insurance insurance companies. Yeah. And what happens is Medicare pays SCAN or United Healthcare a monthly fee, whether you go to the doctors or not. And in return for that fee, it's somewhere around, I'm going to guess six to $700 per month per person. 
and they promised the government that they would provide all of these services for you. So, and you need to understand each particular plan. And right now you can choose to change plans. This is the time period. Uh, what do you usually, do you usually make any suggestions when people are looking at different plans? Heck no. <laughs> what we do, because we're not experts, there's so many Medicare plans, right? Yes. Medicare Advantage plans. It's very confusing and they have little nuances. So I would never claim to know anything about all those details. So what we do is we refer people to a Medicare specialist. We have a couple that we really trust and we send our clients to or their families to, to have those discussions that during open enrollment time. Yeah. Yeah. And same here. We, I do the same thing. And they, when you got, and the thing about these plans is, is that the commission on these plans are set. Mm -hmm. So no matter what insurance agent you go to, the, the commission is actually essentially the same. So somebody should not be making recommending a plan to you unless it was in your best interest. And I want to focus in that the mo one of the most important parts is Part D, prescriptions are because not all private insurance companies pay the same amount, correct? Right, that's true, yeah. yeah. And I think, you know, one of the things since you brought that up, Pete, is one of the things that we provide to our medical uh, Medicare specialists is a list of all the medications that our client is on. And for many of our clients, that's a very, 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 very long list. But that helps them to determine for the, for the cost to our client, what does that mean based on the medications that you take? So that's a really important list to keep very active. And, up and the pricing is unbelievably different. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, we just went through that yesterday with one of my clients and one insurance company had to pay $20 for a drug. Another insurance company was $120 wow. and he needed that drug every 30 days. I mean, on a regular basis. Yeah. So big difference. It's huge. So this is a great time. Don't fall in love with your private insurance company because not every year is the same what that they cover on prescription drugs. And so that changes on an annual basis. And you want to go with the private insurance company that pays you the best on the prescription drugs that you're on. Mm -hmm. All right. Hey, Let's go hang, to on. The next no, wait, hang on. Question for you. It's come up. How does one find a good skilled nursing facility? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's, a, that's an hour conversation. <laughs> I think one, you know, we used to have a time period where I felt very comfortable to say XYZ nursing home is great, right? But I think I found that those days are gone because the staff changes, um, things change. So I don't hold anybody in favor of or anybody else anymore these days, it seems. But um, what I sometimes do, there's Medicare Compare, which is going online and checking out, um, you know, they all have surveys on a regular basis. So that site will give you the results of the surveys from the Medicare um, surveyor. So that's a good place to go. Um, I would check with other people, maybe check with your doctor's office or other people that you know that have used um, nursing um, homes in this area. I do think that maybe um, going to visit and doing the smell test to walk through if you're able to, I know these days it's not a great time to go, but before COVID, um, sometimes family members would go visit maybe the top two or three that they were looking at, possibly as, as a placement for their mom or you know a temporary place for dad while he recovered from his surgery, et cetera. Um, these days with COVID, it's much more difficult, but I think that those few things would start you in the right direction of finding a, a facility. Yeah, and I think that, you know, if you sit down with the social worker and the discharge nurse in the hospital and ask them and say, if your mother or your father had this particular condition that my loved one has now, of the choices that are available of the skilled nursing facility, which one would you use and why? And you look them in the eye, you may have shed a tear, <laughs> but you know, yeah, it's eye to eye and you're serious. 
because what happens a lot of times in discharge nursing, uh, they only have X amount of time. They have a lot of clients and they'll just send you to the first one that's open. So uh, great question. It's a great question. And one and thing it, to follow it, up, Pete, if I can, um, the discharge planner, sometimes they're called case managers in the hospitals. And these people, as, as Pete has, has pointed out, as soon as you hit the floor, you have a discharge planner slash case manager assigned to you. And their job is to get you out of the hospital, um, you know, within a very short amount of time sometimes. And they're going to help to do things like find placement, or if you're going home, they'll help to arrange a hospital bed to be put in the house, or maybe some equipment needs to happen, follow up with home health. They can help with all those things. But I think to your point, Pete, they're incredibly, incredibly busy. Yep. Um, so they're going to do the thing that is the fastest, and I'm not faulting them for this, but they're going to do the fastest and easiest thing. That's and that's just the reality of the attention. high paced environment that they're living in or they're working in. Um, and we would probably all be doing the same thing if we were in their shoes. However, if you don't feel like it's the right place for you or your wife or whoever it is that they're trying to place, push back and say, that place is not going to work for us. You know, we, we had a friend there, a neighbor there, and they had a horrible experience last month. So we need to have some other options. So you can always push back on these things. And um, you just don't, don't have take to accept. it for granted. Yeah. Don, you had a question? Way. Yes, I did. The other thing is, Leanne, you noted the fact that you just changed this page. Yep. It doesn't match the handout. So right. when we're done with this, you're going to give that to me and we're going to reload the handout because that's come up from a couple of people of uh, pages are different. So we will get an updated yes. copy after we're finished. There's not very many differences, but I always tweak and I apologize, but I will get this to you afterwards. They pay attention. They notice they are very good students. Good. And they good. are. Usually good. no one Let's knows. go to the next slide. Um, HiCap is just a wonderful resource for you. Um, it's health insurance counseling and advocacy program through the counseling on aging right here in Orange County. Uh, questions on long-term care insurance, questions on, uh, uh, they will review your long-term care insurance policy. They just won't recommend one. They have Medicare questions. They have an Ombudsman Butts program. Uh, just, 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 just an outstanding resource in the community. And they're totally funded by donations and fines from the different insurance companies. So they're completely independent. Yeah, yeah. That's a you very wonderful resource. you add anything on that, Leanne? No, I think you've done a great job. Even you mentioned before, Pete, about appealing. Like if you feel that your um, loved one is being discharged from the hospital too soon, um, they will help you with the appeal process. So I think that they're an amazing program. They're yeah, amazing if, if you get declined on your long-term care insurance policy, they'll help you to try to figure out how it, you can get covered. Hmm. Awesome group. Yep, absolutely. Long-term so care. These are what you were talking about before with the activities of daily living. Why is it important for your agent for your health care to know these six points? They seem like everybody should understand them. Hmm. So if you're going to get long-term care coverage, you have to have a deficit within some of these activities of daily living. So some say two deficits or three deficits out of the six that are listed there, um, but they help to sort of define when long-term care benefits can, can kick in. Many times these items here, believe it or not, are some of the main reasons why we get phone calls as care managers, because people are not able to manage their day-to-day -day functioning. And this is where, going back to caregiving, having someone come in and provide things like um, assistance with the toileting and the dressing and the bathing, et cetera, that can prevent someone from having, you know, maybe a fall of some sort, ending up in that acute care setting that we talked about earlier and going through the system that way. So when you start to notice yourself or your loved one start to have a few challenges in these areas, it's time to pay attention. Um, these are the things that tend to go sideways and people end up in acute care settings because of them. Yeah. And, and if you're not eating, you don't have strength. Mm -hmm. And, you know, uh, uh, if you're starting to lose a little bit of your balance, you 
you know, you uh, you're transferring an ambulation, it may, uh, uh, gets gets becomes an issue. Mm -hmm. uh, bathing, uh, you know, it's it's. Uh, I've, I've just met with the guy yesterday. He's 92. He says he hasn't taken a shower or a bath in two months. He was doing everything by sponge and didn't want to ask for help because he was embarrassed. You know, so, but every long-term care contract has these six points in it. And you have to have two or three of these issues that are a problem before your long-term care policy will kick in. Um, uh, skilled nursing facilities will use these activities of daily living, whether or not you can live at home by yourself. So these are really important words to use when you're taking care of another individual. And again, your agent for your healthcare needs to understand these. Yeah, so we normally think of long-term care as something that only older people have to use. But, you know, as you put in here, sometimes children need long-term care. Sometimes, you know, if we have a broken leg or we need it in adulthood. Uh, and also, of course, we're, what we're most common with is in the older adult please have a conversation with whomever your agent for your health care is. Um, what I find is, is that most people spend 10 minutes with their agent for their health care. 10 minutes. You can't do it. And you need to talk about these things. Um, let's go to the next slide. Right now, you know, we talked in uh, Laura Tarbox's class, uh, especially in her first class, how it's important to know your net worth and your cash flow. Well, if you're going to um, self-insure for long-term care, uh, those are absolute necessities to know. Um, it can cost, an assisted care facility can cost anywhere from $6,000 to $15,000 per month. In-home care could cost similarly. So if you don't have a long-term care policy, those are coming out of pocket. And uh, uh, you, you put in there emotional uh, and physical health. That is just so important because um, what happens in when, you, when you're married, this, the woman is usually taking care of the man. And guess what? 40% of the women who take care of their spouses die before the person that they're caring for. It is so difficult. It is so hard taking care of another individual, not just emotionally, but taking a, a, a 150 pound man in and out of bed or helping them to the toilet or helping them bathe. It is just an unbelievably difficult job. And a lot of times people wait too long to hire a caregiver. Um, we all hope that we die before we need long-term care. So I'm going to yoga five days a week now. <laughs> Better make it six, Pete. Yeah, yeah, yes. <laughs> uh, we, uh, you know, I, my mother just recently died. She died at 98 years old. But when she was about 85, I sat down with my mother and I said, you know, I'll be happy uh, to have you move in with me and, uh, you know, we'll create a little separate uh, granny flat. And she goes, well, I'd rather die than move <laughs> in with you. <laughs> so so uh, my sister took care of my mother. And uh, but that's another whole conversation that you should have while you are healthy, uh, you know, as to what your options are. Pete? Um, Pete? There's yes. a question on long-term care insurance. It tends to be really expensive if you start it when you're older, correct? 
Correct. And we're going to get to the long-term care insurance in just a little bit. Thank you. Okay. Uh, one of them is to transfer the cost to an insurance company. We're going to go through that on the on on a on a following slide, and then uh, apply for government benefits. So the good news here in California is is that we have Medi-Cal, and it does pay for long-term care. Um, and but you have to you can have certain things like a house, a car, your retirement plan. You don't have to be broke. Be very careful out there because there's a lot of scammers who want to sell you annuities and get rid of all your money and so that you can apply for Medi-Cal. But you have to have 36 months where you are um, not giving away any money that you've spent down as far as your net worth is concerned besides your home. Let's go to the next slide. I believe, yes, this is the long-term care insurance policy. Today, the premium that you pay on an annual or quarterly monthly basis depends on your health, your age, and what kind of policy you're going to purchase. So many of the long-term care insurance carriers have stopped carrying long-term care insurance. Uh, you may want to check with uh, State Farm, Farmers, Genworth, uh, your carrier presently to see if they have a hybrid policy, if that's what you're looking for. An indemnity policy means that the policy itself pays per day whatever your costs are for that day and they have a set amount either in years or um, dollar value. Most of the policies do not have inflation protection. Um, a comprehensive policy includes residential care, home care, respite care, adult daycare, nursing home care. Most of your modern day policies are comprehensive. On some of your older policies, you literally have to move out of your home in order to be covered. So again, who needs to know what kind of policy you have? Your agent for your health care. It is, uh, the statistics are just shocking. Only 1% of all policies in existence actually get used. And most people don't even know that the client or your parents or someone has a policy. So grab your policy, take a look through it, find out how comprehensive it is, and make sure you discuss it with your healthcare agent so that they know that you have it. Uh, I think the next slide is about, uh, yeah, well, yeah. Avoid specific disease policies. Aflac, uh, become a stock owner in that company. Do not get a specific disease. You have to die from that disease in order to collect. You know, just get a regular policy. Determine the financial health of the insurance company. Uh, it's a difficult one, but stay with your top tier companies. There's no reason to go to the lower tier. Um, Moody's, S&P 5, S&P, uh, Dun & Bradstreet, there are, there are companies that will give you the financial health. Who will file your complaint, uh, claim? You have to file it. And so again, that's your agent for your health care or your successor trustee or your power of attorney. Is there an age limit or pre-existing conditions? Some do, but not all. And let's say, for example, you had a heart attack or a stroke. Will they still cover you? Many will, but it will exclude that condition for your long-term care for at least six months to a year. Okay, 30 days to rescind on the contract. 
just like every insurance contract, they're absolutely difficult to understand. And so if you sign one, you have 30 days for no matter what reason to cancel that policy. Okay, let's go to why premiums are the way they are. The higher the elimination period, and what we mean by elimination is, is, is that no benefits are paid during that period of time. You pay out of pocket for your own long-term care, whether it be for the caregiver, whether it be for the assisted care facility, the first zero to 90 days, you pay out of pocket. If you want it from day one, your premium is going to be much higher. So the general national statistic is, if you're 65 years and older, you will need long-term care for 90 days or less. So therefore your premiums are going to be much lower if you take the 90 days. There's some policy that allow you to pay on an, um, to eliminate on, or to uh, have an elimin elimination period for an entire year. And so you say, hey, I can pay out of pocket for an entire year and then I wanna get the insurance to kick in. Again, it's a good thing to discuss with your financial advisor or with the agent who's selling you the long-term care policy so that you can get an idea what the premium would be. What would be my premium if I had a 30-day? What would it, would it be if I had a year? What would it be if I had 90 days? Age. Um, it's absolutely important, uh, uh, but I, we've had individuals who've gotten policies at 85 years old and it's feasible to do, uh, but again, you're gonna pay a much higher price and it's per day reimbursement. So the average need for reimbursement, let's say caregiving cost, um, I just had a quote the other day, it was $500 per day for a 24 seven online or onboard caregiving service, which meant that three different individuals came in around the clock. So, uh, you know, it's just expensive. Uh, and you wanna try to figure that out. What is gonna be your daily reimbursement from your insurance company? Wait, uh, the higher it is, the higher your premium is going to be. Pete? Yeah. In the elimination period, do I have to prove that I paid the out-of-pocket expense during that yes. time? Okay. Yes, you will have uh, an individual, uh, sometimes a registered nurse that will say, when did you check in to the facility or when did you hire the caregiver? And yes, they absolutely check on that. And the other part of that, or one that's related to it. So if I'm, if I'm looking to try to find out care for my mother, mother-in-law, whoever it happens to be, the real question is, do they have long-term care? Because, or where, do, how does one figure out if there's insurance for that? Uh, oh, you mean as far as if, if, if the mother-in-law has the insurance policy? Obviously it's going to have to be on that, on her policy in that case. So the question yeah. is get a hold of what information does she have on what her policy covers? You're gonna to have to actually look for the policy in her house and read that policy. And okay. if you can't understand the policy, which if you're normal, you can't, then you gotta call HICAP. Mm -hmm. Call HICAP. They have a volunteers over there that will sit down with you and go through that policy so that you can understand it. Okay, since you've raised it, I'll ask the question then. So what's the number for HICAP? Because in the slide you had it and the handout you dumped. Okay, the, here, Leanne. <laughs> Jeez, oh, how oh, proud. Oh, oh. There you how go. How proud. There's the OC number. 714-560-0424. That answers several of the questions we have outstanding. Yeah. <laughs> Thank yeah. you. And, okay, let's go back to the other slide. Oh, sorry. There we go. So uh, I think we are, yeah, the age. So uh, 
So most individuals start looking at the long-term care policy when they're between 60 and 70 years old. And they should be looking at probably somewhere between $6,000 to $10,000 annually in cost. But it just depends on your insurance company, on your health, what kind of daily reimbursement that you want, what kind of elimination period that you want. Just remember that the insurance agent makes a great commission on these, anywhere from 35% to 150% of your first year premium. Just make sure that they run through a variety of scenarios if that's if you want long-term care. But remember, first of all, look to self-insure. See if that's a comfort for you and make sure whoever your agent is or successor trustee, especially a family member, they need to make that check out $10,000 a month to the care facility or to the caregivers. So who is there a possible conflict of interest there? Mm. You know? I mean, I had a neighbor who came over to complain and said, my inheritance is being uh, diminished by the cost of caregiving. Maybe I'll bring my dad home. You know, money should not be a consideration when you're when when you're someone is looking out for your care. And and we all don't want to spend money, but it's a really important question to ask is, you know, uh, uh, some people feel they want to spend the minimum amount, amount amount at the end of their life to be taken care of. Well, from my point of view, that's when you need the money. You should have the best care possible to make you comfortable. Mm -hmm. So let's go to the next slide. Medi-Cal, as we said before, it's there in an emergency. It provides the custodial care. You can protect your home, vehicle, burial plan. If you need or if you know someone who needs Medi-Cal, have them meet with an elder law attorney. Elder law attorney. Uh, we talked about that uh, Christina McGonnell is an elder law attorney, and there are good elder law attorneys in the community. Do not go to an insurance agent or a financial advisor to, uh, to get Medi-Cal. You need some good professional ethical advice, but thankfully it's there for us. And if the more people who abuse it means that who people who really need it can't get it. Let's go to the next slide. Um, I can't remember uh, all options for long-term care. Okay. <laughs> uh, most skilled nursing home facilities are there for rehabs, not for long-term care. Assisted living, there's over 6,500 assisted living homes in Orange County. It's not a problem of choice. Many of them are, are look really nice. They have one to three marketing directors. Uh, you know, from my point of view, when you look at an assisted care facility, find out how long have the employees been there? Are they happy? Uh, does it, does it, uh, does it look kind of chaotic and crazy? If you go into an assisted care facility and everybody's on the couch watching TV on drugs, probably not a good place. Um, any comments that you want to make, Leanne, on the assisted care facility? I think on the assisted living side, and we may disagree on this, Pete, I don't know, but there are some people out there that do nothing but placements. And there are some people who do not necessarily have the best intentions. So I think if, again, you find someone in the community that is a trusted resource, we have two 
placement specialists that we work with that I feel very comfortable. I would send my parents to them. And these are people who know these facilities. There's no way you can get to know all those facilities, obviously, in Orange County. So they will take what the criteria are. Maybe you want to have a board and care for your mom or for yourself. You want it to be in Mission Viejo. You want it to have these amenities, whatever that looks like. And they will help match you to that place. Um, they will, non-COVID times, they will tour with you. Um, I know that there's a lot of virtual tours going on these days, but there are people that specialize in these kinds of things. Um, the people that we work with, um, you know, there's referral fees and those kinds of things. So we expect that people are going to get paid for their time and their effort. However, for these placement specialists, the person looking for a facility does not have to pay. They're paid by the facility themselves. So there's issues with that, obviously. However, if you find a really um, credible, a really reputable placement professional, I would say go that route to find yourself an assisted living facility. Yeah. It, it, it's a great question to ask, and it's how are you paid? Right. Will you refer me to a facility that doesn't pay you? Right, right. You know, so yeah. there are ethical people out there, and but there's also unethical. And uh, that's why, you know, I, my preference to pay somebody on an hourly basis versus a commission, uh, but there are good commission people out there. Go yeah. through people like Leanne. Home and Leanne, care. and Leanne, they can send you an email, and you will give them the information on those people. Absolutely, yeah. Thank yeah. you. Absolutely. Home care is <laughs> caregivers, and there's plenty of caregiving agencies out there. Yes. Uh, the rates today are somewhere between $22 to $35 an hour. Is that my I'd that say 35 seeing? would be really high, but yes. So I think one thing to be careful of here, and I think people fall into this um, area a little bit, is do I hire someone from an agency or do I go private with a caregiver? And there are risks when you go private. So just be very aware that if something happens and you have a private caregiver on your, your property, there's issues. So there's workers' comp issues, there's liability issues. Hey, well, um, yeah, so be very careful if you're even considering going with a private caregiver. Yeah. The state a few years ago, I don't know, Pete, 2016, I think they came out with regulations saying that caregivers needed to be, um, you know, sort of gone through the process with the state. They had to be fingerprinted. Um, so there's some expectations now before that came down in 2016, there was just everybody was doing whatever they wanted to out there. So it is getting a little bit better in terms of oversight and regulation. It's not ideal, but it's better. Um, but still, you have to be very careful with that. There are a lot of home care companies that are agency based. We tend to use ones that have um, a, a large pool of caregivers so that if someone calls in sick or if there isn't that love connection between a client and a caregiver that they're able to switch people out more easily. The smaller home care companies, they might be great. I'm not saying they're not, but a lot of our cases are our caregivers are needed 24 seven. Um, so we have to have companies that have a large pool of caregivers. So that's a criteria for us. Um, the other one is to consider a home care company that has a person on board that's called a case manager or a care manager. And, and this gets confusing, right? From the very beginning of this presentation, we talked about how the term care manager is confusing. This is another area that it gets confusing. Home care companies can have a case manager or a care manager involved. This is someone who follows the case closely, knows the caregivers going in there. Um, with some of the companies we work with, they will order, um, they will order groceries for the home. They will Will take care of any issues related to maybe um, a new lock is needed on the front door. They will organize that. So we tend to go towards home care companies that provide that, that level of oversight because otherwise who's going to do those things, right? How does that get done? You can use our service, but we're way more expensive than using the home care um, case manager. And usually these are people who are not clinical in nature. They're not nurses. They're not social workers mostly, um, but they can be a cost savings when they're able to do those kinds of activities to help that person stay put in their home, whether home is board and care, whether home is a private home or assisted living. Caregivers can be in any of those settings. Yeah. I usually recommend that, that, that individuals kind of plan for three to five hundred thousand dollars in liquid assets when they get to be past 85, 90 years old, 
First of all, though, please understand, most of us will not need long-term care. <laughs> and if we do need long-term care, it's going to be a very a brief period of time. So uh, it's just that it's so expensive when we do. Mm -hmm. And with Alzheimer's, uh, if you have a major stroke, uh, you're just not capable of bathing or ambulating or buttoning your shirt. It just makes life very difficult. So liquidity towards the end of your life becomes really, really important. And, uh, and home care is a major decision. And especially for individuals who have already lost a spouse, you know, and they're single and by themselves. So it, I, would, you know, I, I would hesitate to do this to a friend to say, hey, friend, I'll take care of you. You take care of me. It is just an enormous amount of work. Yeah, and just, uh, just be ready to, in the event, have that conversation. Um, uh, many of us are going to need it. Most of us won't. And I think, Pete, a good point that you're maybe trying to make here, too, is that in terms of pre-conversation, talking to your loved ones, especially people that are going to be making decisions for you, is talking about whether you envision staying in your home until you pass away or if you're open to, go to going to an assisted living. Um, we had a client that um, we actually, it was a couple that we had on service and he passed away. We expected that to happen. They were living in their private home. She's now living by herself with 24 hours, seven days a week caregivers. And she is not that person. She is a social, she has Alzheimer's disease. So she can't remember what happened five minutes ago, but she is a lover of life. She will talk your arm off. You will want to talk um, to her for a long time. She's wonderful. She loves to dance and sing and laugh. Um, we made a recommendation that an assisted living, a Silverado actually specifically because of her illness, but um, an assisted living, staying at home by yourself with one it's caregiver is exactly. not the way to go. So you're social so, animals. Exactly. My mother, if she didn't have somebody to complain about, she wasn't happy. <laughs> so, you know, we need that. We yeah. need to have that interaction with people. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, the advanced care healthcare directive is what we talked about in the it's your estate course. It gives somebody the legal authority to make decisions for you when you can't make one yourself, but it doesn't help out what decisions to make for you unless you have a conversation with them. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Uh, the healthcare uh, uh, directive. You can pick one up from the California Medical Association online, or you can give them a call, or you can go to the Office of Attorney General. Yeah, I and and you can pick one up for free. I like the California Medical Association one because most doctors and nurses understand that one. Uh, next slide. This is one of my favorite documents and. Uh, this has nothing to do with being legal. This is all about uh, how do you talk about death? How do you talk about dying? Uh, whether you want hospice care, whether you want palliative care, who do you want me to talk to in the family about your medical care? Even more important, who do you want me not to talk about, about your medical care in your family? Um, uh, you know, people believe that hospice care means that you're going to die. No, it means that you had a 50% chance of dying in the next six months. So people don't like talking about dying. I love talking about dying because it makes my day to day even more important. This booklet is absolutely free. There's no charge one per person. You can get it by going online or you can give them a call. If you want to get more than one booklet, I think the cost is an extra $2.50. Um, they could use it. Uh, uh, they're a wonderful organization and the website is really a great website, has a lot of excellent information on there. Uh, we talked a little bit about that. Let's just go to the next slide. 
What is the post? Some of you may have seen this pink form roaming around. Uh, it's been around for several years now, but basically it is a legal document. It is actually a physician order. So if you go to an ER or you go to a skilled nursing facility, wherever you go, it is a doctor's order to be followed. Um, so people, even if you go to, maybe you're going to San Francisco to visit family and you happen to have an accident while you're there or a heart attack and you have this pulse form with you, you go to a hospital where no one knows you, they're going to follow the pulse. This is usually recommended for someone who is um, expected to pass within the next 12 months. So of course, no one knows for sure, but that is sort of the window of time for you and I. Um, for most of us on the line here today, if something were to happen to us, we would want to have everything done for us. That may change as we get older or if we have conditions that, ha that allow us to kind of say to ourselves, eh, you know, I don't know that I would really want to be resuscitated at this point in my life and that's okay. That's where you document on here. So it documents things. Do you want to have uh, CPR if your heart was to stop? Do you want to have full treatment? Do you want to be put in an ICU? Do you want to have a ventilator? Do you want to have a feeding tube? Um, it asks all those questions of what you would want. Um, and again, it's a doctor's order that must be followed when you hit an emergency room or emergency department. On the back of this is basically the full form of all the goodies. The, the really important elements are listed on the front page here. On the back is just a little uh, section for, for signatures, et cetera. But this is a really good thing to take with you if you're having that end of life sort of advanced care planning discussion with your primary care physician. This is a great document to, to talk about if you have very strong feelings about not wanting certain care to happen to you. If you want the full shebang and you want everything done for you, not such an important document. Yeah. And, 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 and where do you begin to understand what the full services mean? Mm. You know, there's an article on the website that uh, on our, uh, on our materials page and the article uh, list, how do doctors choose to die? You know, there is only one extraordinary thing that most doctors will uh, uh, will take, and that is morphine, mm. you know, but morphine can kill. And so it's important for your agent to know, do you want more morphine that may hasten your death or, hey, give me the minimum amount? Um, this whole COVID-19 on ventilators. You know, uh, my father was on a ventilator for six weeks mm. and never, ever recovered because we didn't have the advanced health care directive. We didn't have a pulse and our family disagreed. Mm -hmm. So he stayed on the ventilator. Don't ever, ever, ever want that to happen to another individual. Uh, uh, a feeding tube. You know, a feeding tube may work for a week to two weeks, depending on your condition. But if you're in the process of dying, a feeding tube is exactly the opposite. And it could work to, against you. And, and, you know, family members want to do everything possible to keep you alive because they love you. But you got to tell them what you want especially the person who's going to be your agent for your health care. And sometimes uh, that person who you designate as your number one person may not be a family member. It may be somebody outside the family. Sometimes you have to figure who is a person that would stand up for me and make sure that my wishes are followed and my directives are followed. Uh, family members may say, you know what, she talked to me about this, but I really want her to be alive to see 2021 and see how great 2021 is going to be. You want someone who understands your choices and will stand up for those choices and not give way to pressure from other people. And to the point of what Pete said about um, uh, talking with family members ahead of time. It really is a gift to your family to have these conversations ahead of time. I've worked in hospice care and probably one of the most difficult things we would see happen is when exactly what you said, Pete, family members don't agree with what should happen with mom. 
and that is a heart a heartbreaking place to be. So if you can document your choices, have that discussion with the people who will be standing up for you at bedside, that is ideally the best way to go. Everybody clear on what you want and what you don't want and we'll stand up to that. We're entering into holiday time. No one's really festive so much these days, but we're entering into hol holiday time when families are kind of getting together or maybe they're having their Thanksgiving dinner by Zoom. But these are the times that we encourage families to sit down with a bottle of wine and have these conversations. Talk about what you want at end of life. Ask them what they want at end of life. I would prepare them before you arrive at, or they arrive at your door with a bottle of wine, what you're gonna be talking about. But um, there are ways and they're actually if you search online, there's different tools that people can use to engage in those conversations. One's called Go Wish, um, but there's different card games, et cetera, that actually set you up for having these conversations and make it a little bit easier to get those conversations going. Yeah. Um, you talk, had asked, I'm <laughs> um, oh, sorry. I, uh, just, uh, I talked so much about death with my mother. She said, if I brought it up one more time, <laughs> she was going to eliminate me from her estate. Anyway. <laughs> What is Coalition for Compassionate Care? Uh, before you start, Leanne, Don, I got that we have about nine minutes left. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. We got nine minutes left, Leanne. Okay. See, he talks so much and then he gives me like the, the last few yes. minutes of the present. <laughs> yes. I know how he rolls. So you had mentioned uh, or asked a few minutes ago, Pete, how people understand how these different interventions really work. So the Coalition for Compassionate Care of California is a wonderful, wonderful website and organization. So they really try and provide a lot of education about what does it mean to have a ventilator? What does it mean to have a feeding tube? What does it mean to have CPR if my heart were to stop? So this is the kind of information that if I was to go and have my sit down with my primary care physician to go over my advanced care planning, I would want to make sure that I've reviewed these kinds of documents before I go and have that conversation. It really talks about the risk, perhaps, of having a, a feeding tube inserted. You know, there's a risk of infection, there's a risk of aspiration, getting this, the feeds into your lungs, those kinds of things. You need to understand that to be able to make decisions for yourself or for your loved one if they're not competent to make those decisions for themselves right now. You have to understand what these terms mean. No one's going to probably sit down and go over all this with anybody to any great depth. So the Compassionate Care um, of California Coalition is a wonderful resource for getting that kind of information. Incidentally, I agree completely. They're absolutely fantastic documents. Know that when Leanne says she goes into it, I'm going to guess she's a member because it's a little bit of a fight to figure out where the pieces are that I just want these individual documents. So be aware, they're great when you find them. It oh, can be a little okay. bit of a challenge to find them. Oh, thank you, Don. Maybe we should put those on, on your website then. Maybe. Why don't we do that? Make it easy. All right. Uh, in terms of palliative care versus hospice care, there's always a lot of discussion about what, what's the difference between these two things. When I started in hospice care many years ago, there was no differentiation. Over the last several years, four, five, six years, there has been a, a differentiation created. Um, in terms of palliative care, it's a tricky space. So if you're calling for palliative care, ask that palliative care program what's included. And I think that when you call different organizations and ask them what their palliative care program includes, you will get a different answer, a little bit of a different answer each time. Yeah. There's not a lot of reimbursement for palliative care at this time. I think that's gonna be changing, but I thought that that was the way it was gonna be five, six years ago, but I still haven't seen a big change. There's just not a lot of reimbursement for it. Yeah, and, and different insurance companies cover different things. Yeah, exactly. So some people will put it through home health or they'll put it through some other different um, benefit, but it is a bit of a murky place um, even, even today. So the difference is with palliative care, maybe I get a diagnosis of um, lung cancer next week. My palliative care, if I can get a program to follow me, my palliative care can kick in right away. So they're gonna take care of things like symptoms. So if I go through chemo for my lung cancer, I'm gonna probably have nausea. I'm gonna have some psychosocial issues. I'm gonna have stress. Maybe I'm gonna to need to talk to a therapist or a social worker of some sort. I may have religious kinds of questions in my mind. Maybe I wanna to talk to a chaplain. So those kinds of services can be offered to me through a palliative care program while I'm receiving curative care. 
if you go over to hospice care, they're not talking cure anymore. They're talking care only. Um, hospice care, as you've referenced, Pete, is really for people in the last six months of life. In palliative, you know, is whenever the person comes on to palliative care to treat those symptoms um, that they may have. Yeah, so you can get on and off of hospice care right, anytime. Right. Right. So you can come off of it and just go seek curative care. Maybe I get to a point with my lung cancer that I say, I, I'm done. I'm done. I'm going to go on hospice care. But maybe I hear about a new treatment on uh, CNN a few nights later and I decide, you know what? The heck with hospice. I'm going to go back and I'm going to look for this curative care that just came out, a, a new chemo perhaps. And I can do that six months or eight months or two months down the line. I'm not doing well. I can go back on to hospice care. Um, but hospice care provides all those kinds of services wherever that person is living, whether it's a board and care, whether it's a skilled nursing facility or private home, they will come with their nurses, their doctors, their, their social workers, their chaplains, their home health aides, etc. cetera. Um, so all that's included within the hospice Med care benefit, yeah. very generous benefit. Medicare pays for it all. And yeah. it's a wonderful program. Let's yeah. go to the next slide. We On the materials page, we have a whole discussion of that. Okay. All right. Q and A time. So I'll give you the one question. What the one question that's left? You oh. mentioned Silverado for yes. mental health for mental care. If, if in theory, if if the patient has all the all six of the ADLs are in place, will long term care pay for Silverado? Of course, if you're at Silverado, you don't have all six of them. You've got at least one or two of them missing. Um, but can you go to Silverado on long term care? You can go to long-term care on Silverado, but you have to have two or three of your policy issues, i.e. you can't bathe, you can't, you have trouble eating, mm -hmm. uh, you have trouble dressing, and then the long-term care policy would kick in and pay for your care at Silverado. And Silverado is one of the best in the community. It's also one of the most expensive and they have counselors that'll help you try to get the coverage as, as quickly as possible. Mm -hmm. so Leanne, Leanne, go one more slide. Oh, oh Because yeah. that way people know how to get in touch with you. And that question yes. has come up several times. Uh, so I just want to make sure while we're having this conversation that uh, that is in fact up and available to people. That's the only remaining question. I've either annoyed you or you've answered your own questions along the way at this point. So <laughs> yeah, <laughs> this entire area is very confusing because the state of the medical industry, and it is an industry, uh, you know, is in a state of flux. Um, um, a medical care is not a given right. And uh, so your institutions are, are, are looking at it from a minimum amount of liability. And, and, and you got to understand that there are, dying is just a huge business. I mean, it's, it's amazing. Uh, you, you, once you die, you lose that, they lose that economic benefit. And then you get into the mortuary business. And so- there. Pete, we're not going there because we just did, did just get another question. So if my spouse is on, if my spouse is on hospice care, can I take them to the hospital or to an emergency room? Oh, that's a really good question. Yes. So um, hospice would prefer that you just call them, but if there is an urgent issue, so say say that hospice patient falls and bonks their head and cracks open their head and absolutely go to the ER. That person comes off of hospice care as soon as they hit the ER because it's both part A of Medicare is paying for that. So you can't have two things going at the same time. So they would go on to part A for the hospitalization acute care, get patched up and then can go back onto hospice and head home again. Thank you. But I would recommend strongly that the facility that you have your mother, father or loved one in that they give you a call. Their assisted care facilities are quick to call 911. Mm. And, you know, uh, I don't know. I've had many a conversations with care facilities saying that this person doesn't want any extraordinary care to keep them alive, so long as they're comfortable. Mm. Uh, but they're worried about liability. And so, they don't have any liability if they call 911. 
Right. And if 911 comes in and um, a fireman or a medic, they have to, by law, unless there's a DNR, they have to, by law, take care of you. And so, so that's where the, the pulse, the pink pulse form that we talked about earlier, that's why that is so important. And that should be on uh, the cupboard if it's like an assisted living room or if it's a private home on the fridge, very clearly stating that that person does not want resuscitation. And incidentally, this is Pete and I disagree on this one and that's fine. I, I happen to be, my sister is five years older than me. I am her designated person to take care of everything. She lives north of Santa Barbara. If she falls, does something happens, I can't be there within X period of time. She has a pulse at her decision on her refrigerator because the paramedics know they're to look at a refrigerator for a pink sheet and these are her wishes. And then once I get there, then I can deal with it. And if you have a pulse, you can change it anytime you want. You just mm -hmm. go to the doctor and say, I've decided I want to have a, no longer have a DNR. Yep. And then you can have it signed. So it's, it's not a, oh my God, I have to go see a lawyer. No. So no. Pete and I disagree on a poll. No, no, side. actually we don't disagree because she <laughs> she's, lives three She's only 75, she's not 85. But there are exactly. a lot of people today, especially with COVID, where they're a signed caretaker, their their person, their their person responsible for them is out of the area mm -hmm. and they can't get here now. So to me, this is an option to consider. Absolutely. Yeah. Because it's a talk doctor's about order. Who, did, professional fiduciaries can be your health care agent. Um I tend not to favor friends, uh, but their reg retired nurses are absolutely wonderful. Mm -hmm. And if you have a lay person, uh, make sure that you know people like Leanne, that somebody can call them and say, hey, I need some help. Try to figure out what is the best medical decision to make. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Leanne. You're awesome. Thank you for inviting me. You're it's welcome. always fun. <laughs>